Thank you for your presence, God. Hallelujah. Put your hands together, church. Jesus, thank you. 
whatever you are suffering right now, your sickness, your finances, emotions. If you are feeling broken right now, surrender everything to our Lord. Because we know He has victory. We know that the Lord has given you victory. Let no one else take away your crown of victors. Because the Lord has ordained you with a victory of crown. You have your own crown of victory. Amen. Yes, Jesus.
Chapter 9, the highs and the lows. Father, we thank you, Lord, that in life, O oh God, we go through good days and bad days, O oh God. Lord, help us in those good days, O oh God, to know that your goodness just overflows, O oh God, and be grateful. And Lord, on the bad days, Lord, help us to know, O oh God, that it, it will soon pass, that you have a purpose for it. So give us grace to live on the mountains and in the valleys of our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In Luke chapter 9, there are a number of stories there that we'll be looking at. Uh, not just one story, but a couple of stories, a couple of events. But in it, I want to bring across um, a pattern of the Christian life. In a sense, if you look at this chapter, it's like a spiritual roller coaster. I don't know whether you have ever taken a roller coaster. I have been to Six Flags in Dallas, and uh, I don't like it. I don't like to puke in my, into, and I don't like to have to wear double underwear because of the fear element of roller coasters. But life sometimes is like a roller coaster. And as much as we would like stability throughout our life, meaning that it's just like a simple train ride without bumps, without any change of elevation, life is not that way. And we see in, in some of these stories from chapter 9 of Luke that it begins with a spiritual high where the disciples are out in, on the mountain with Jesus and he preaches a sermon on the mount and then he feeds 5,000. Five loaves, two fishes. And it's not just about the feeding of 5,000. It was the fact that they were there. They were part of it. And I mean, if you, if you don't get a spiritual high from that, then, then you, must, you must be a robot. You must not be alive. And then you go from there to another mountain. Mount of Transfiguration, where the three closest disciples, Peter, James, and John, are out on the mountain, and Jesus gets transformed, his body, because there was God, and Moses and Elijah appears. I mean, like, wow, how high can you go? I don't think any one of us have ever been there. And then it takes you to a low, where the disciples try to cast out a demon, and the demon laughs at them, and they walk away, feeling like losers. So sometimes life throws you those curveballs as well as the great mighty experiences. But first I want to talk about the high point of discipleship. Discipleship is that life with Christ. Discipleship is that following Christ and walking with Him. Discipleship is really living the life that God desires us to live. In Luke 9, it begins with that story. And I focus in on verse 11. It says, When the multitudes knew it, they followed him. Multitudes. Who doesn't like multitudes? I mean, if you're a rock singer, if you're a musician, if you're a pastor, who doesn't like multitudes? Especially when you are the center of attraction. Especially when you're in the thick of it. And part of the discipleship process is when we follow Christ, we don't want to be just one or two. 
or even 100 or 200. We want to be in the thousands. Because, man, I mean the feeling. The feeling of being involved in something bigger than yourself, larger than life. And then, of course, in verse 17, after they had fed the 5,000, experienced the miracles, in verse 17, it describes it all. It says, so they all ate and were filled. I think that's what life is all about. We want to eat. We want to consume life, especially miracles and all, the excitement. And we want to be filled. We want to be full filled, isn't it? I mean, who wants to go through life feeling like they're being cheated or shortchanged? I don't want to be that person. And so that's the spiritual high. That's the highs of discipleship. And I love it. I'm drawn by it. I talked about it for the longest time. When we started this church, I would constantly would tell the people, one day I hope there will be a big crusade and, and big event, evangelistic, where you can get involved and you're in the thick of it and, and people are getting saved and multitudes. And wow, I talked about it for a long time and then it happened. And the members who never experienced it before, and when they were there with us in Walgers Arena, when people were walking down by the thousands to get saved, and they were part of it. Wow, the feeling. I love that. Why? Because partnership in miracles produces a spiritual high. Partnership in discipleship, partnership in God's business or ministry. Man, it takes you there. That's what it's all about. The feeling of victory, the joy when we are closely involved, like in the Festival of Hope. You can, you can sit in it and, and think about it and look at the pictures and you're like, I wish we could do this every Sunday, every week. The excitement seeing multitudes coming to listen. The Bible says, when the multitudes knew it, the moment they heard Jesus was there, they were running. That's what revivals, that's what revivals are all about. I pray for a revival in Canada. I pray that this will happen before the rapture. I pray this will happen before things get worse, even as we look around the world, because we need it. The world is lost. I pray that our, my eyes will be able to see one more revival where people flood into a stadium. I witnessed that. I was front and center in it when multitudes and multitudes, week after week, year after year, whenever we have big events, they will pack out the facilities. And man, who doesn't want that? And you're part of it. You're a partner in it. So the excitement, the fulfillment in participating in miracles is another thing. You see, this is the thing about Jesus. He doesn't tell us to be just the audience. He doesn't just tell us, be a fan and sit back and watch. He says, be a participant. And that's where, if you look at discipleship, it's not just follow me and watch. Jesus says, follow me and do. He says, the things that I do, greater things will you do in my name. I love that. Participation. And that's where when he came to feeding the 5,000, Jesus could have done it. He could have done it himself. He didn't need the boy, five loaves, two fishes. He didn't need to do that. He didn't need the disciples to go and, 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 and walk around with the basket and the bread. He didn't need to do all those things. He could have just said, bread fall down from heaven. They did it in the Old Testament. Manna fell from heaven. Quail fell from heaven. He could have done it. But he involved his disciples because he knew. He knew that they would be addicted. They would be so drawn. They will be so forever transformed by it. And that's where in verse 17, again, that verse that I love, they ate and were filled. When you consume, when you are part of a miracle, you become so fulfilled. You're so filled. Words cannot describe it. 
Tony Evans, when he was talking about discipleship, he says, the process of discipleship is a process of authority transfer or authority and power transfer. So he doesn't just call us to follow him and pick up the pieces and do the work that nobody else wants to do, that the work that Jesus doesn't want to do. No, no, no. He, he gives us the same work that he does. The same power that he possesses, he puts it on us. He makes duplicates. That's what discipleship is all about. The high of discipleship is Jesus had power. Jesus cast out demons. Jesus raised the sick from the sick bed, the dead from the tombs. He said, I'm giving it to you. I'm making a duplicate of my power, of my calling, of my authority. I'm placing it on you. You go do it now. That's the high. That's what I've been enjoying all these years. And that's what I'm trying to do when I spend time with you. Preaching to you, teaching, hanging out, praying that it will rub off, it will flow to you too. That's part of the high. And of course, there's a fellowship in the high places of His presence. Another event. It's not just the doing. It's not just the participating. It's not just the seeing the multitudes. Now, it's the fellowship. It's the presence. Part of the discipleship process that takes you to that high place is worship. And of course, part of that happened, you know, in the same chapter in Luke 9, verse 28. It came to pass after eight days after these things, he took Peter, James, and John. He went up to the mountain, high place again. God has his high places. The enemy has their high places. God's high places is about his presence. The enemy's high praises is about curses and bad things that he wants to do. And as Jesus prayed, appearance, his face was altered. He was transfigured. His robe became white, glistening. And behold, two men talked with him, who were Moses and Elijah. I love again a similar thought and experience of the psalmist in Psalm 1835. He makes my feet like hind's feet. He sets me upon high places. Isaiah 40, we were sore on wings of eagles. Have you ever had that feeling? I've had many, many times. God bringing you, even as you are caught up in worship, even as you give yourself totally over to God, in the high praises, He takes you to high places. So, to, so I would challenge you, experience. You know, yes, maybe you'll never have a mountaintop experience where you see Moses and Elijah and Jesus transfigured. But we can have it here when we gather. It really depends on you, your desire. How high you go depends on how big your desire is and how big your heart is. And you can be lost in it. And I believe prayer alters our present reality. How did it happen when they went up to the mountain? A mountain is a mountain until it's not a mountain when you begin to pray and then it becomes a spiritual mountain. In Mount Transfiguration, it says, it came to pass after eight days, he took Peter, James, and John up to the mountain to pray. Prayer alters our present reality. Prayer changes it. You know, the world around you may be going crazy. Russia may be invading the Ukraine. The world may be going in a different direction. COVID-19 may be killing people and who knows what else is out there. But prayer can change your present reality. It can change the condition of your heart, your mind. Even if the whole world is on fire, God can take you into His own reality. Then I want to move to from the highs to the lows. I want to talk about the low down and discipleship. You know, I'm, I'm not one of those salesmen who comes knocking on your, your door and, and tries to sell you a vacuum cleaner and, and tells you all the good things about the vacuum cleaner. This vacuum cleaner can, can, can suck a, a, a bowling ball and everything else and it will last forever. But you know, somewhere along the line, the lowdown comes, right? Oh, this vacuum cleaner is so good, so good. 
it will cost you $2,500, three installments. That's the lowdown, isn't it? He gives you the good stuff, and then he comes down with a punchline. You want it? You got to pay for it. You want it? Go ahead. You got to bid for it. Every mountain has its valley. Every Christian, every disciple will experience their spiritual highs. But you know what? We go up to the mountain to get pumped up. But we go into the valleys to do the work of God. That's where the grinding and the pounding and the fighting and the living. That's where it is. And discipleship is not always going to be a high time in high places with God. In the same chapter, after participating in the, one of the greatest miracles, feeding 5,000, after going up to Mount Transfiguration, now they have a spiritual low. It happened. Saying, this is life. It happened. They come down from the mountain. What a picture. Spiritual high. Welcome to the valley. Welcome to reality. Welcome to life. Suddenly, a man from the multitude cried, cried out, Teacher, I employ you. Look at, on my son. He's my only child. A spirit seizes him and he suddenly cries out. It convulses him. He foams at the mouth and he, it departs from him with great difficulty bruising him. So I implored your disciples to cast it out, the demons that is, and they could not. Bummer. Ministry is going down to the valleys of life. And that's where reality sets in. The reality is this, you don't always get what you want. You don't always win all your battles. You don't always get what you hope for. Sometimes what you pray for, and you think that God is wanting to give you that, that's not what God's will is. And in this case, the disciples were up there where they were gung-ho. They had participated in a miracle. They had seen the resurrected Elijah and Moses. What else? They couldn't cast out a demon. What a letdown. All the air in the balloon was let out with that pinprick of failure. It burst their bubble. We want the highs of Christian experience. We all want that. But the truth is, living is down here in the valley. You know, when they were up there, when they were enjoying the highs of Mount Transfiguration, Peter said to Jesus, and it's always Peter. Peter always has the brightest idea. Peter is always the one who opens his mouth, and then we know what goes into his mouth, his foot. Master, it's good for us to be here. Of course it's good. Let us make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. Not knowing what he said. <laughs> Not knowing what he said. Explains it all. Basically, he's saying, God, forget about the people. Jesus, forget about the dying. Forget about the lost. Forget about the needy. Because they just came from that, right? They just fed. The people who were hungry, Jesus had just healed the sick. He says, forget about all that. Let's live here forever and ever. Let's just enjoy life. Let's just float around in heaven. Not knowing what he has said. Church, let me say this. Every experience has its place and purpose. I've had the privilege and the blessing of experiencing one major revival. I wish every week was like that. I wish every church experiences it. But you know what? You cannot manufacture revival. There's still too many pastors, too many churches in North America that try to manufacture revival week after week. They try to, to work themselves into a frenzy and, 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 and work themselves in a place where, where they imagine the Spirit of God is flowing. And, but it's just flesh. And that's what Peter is doing. He's trying to build a tabernacle. He's trying to build a virtual heaven. But Jesus said, but I call you to earth. 
I call you to the valleys where the needs are. Every experience has its place and purpose. And I lo love Toby Mac's song where he says, the God on the mountain is still God in the valley. In other words, hey, that's the time and a place for everything. And where God is, that's where you need to be. And God is here, working in the valleys. So God uses the low moments of life to teach us precious truths. He uses the high moments, the mountaintop experiences to inspire us. The glory-filled supernatural moments of our life lift us up and launch us into ministry. But then the letdowns, the low downs of life humble us, break us, melt us, mold us into the man, the woman of God that He wants us to be. Because the truth is this, that whilst God is interested in ministering to the lost, while God's interested in you fulfilling the commission of God, He's more interested in you becoming more like Christ. He loves us. We are His workmanship. Winston Churchill, the last great politician of Great Britain, he said, mountaintops inspire leaders, but valleys mature them. It's what matures them, builds character. See, low moments of life, again, appear. Just when you thought that, you, that Peter, James, and John had passed another low moment because they couldn't cast out the demons, then it moved them to the next lower moment in discipleship, where they fought over who was the greatest. And really in life, many of us, we fight over meaningless issues when the main work is left unfinished. Look around us today. How many Christians were out there for the freedom movement? How many Christians were there fighting for political significance versus how many Christians out there in the valleys of life saving souls? pulling souls from hell to populate heaven. We fight over meaningless issues when the main work is left unfinished. That's the lowdown on discipleship. So much of Christianity, so much of what we see today is a distraction, it's a misdirection because of misinformation and they're chasing down all the wrong things, fighting over the things that really don't matter that show our lack of wisdom, our lack of maturity, our lack of understanding of the character and the plan of God. Luke 9, 46, it says, A dispute arose. Isn't that what happens every week now across North America? A dispute. A new dispute arose. And it sounds just like this. A new dis a dispute arose among them to which of them would be the greatest. Peter says, I'm the greatest. John says, no, 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 I'm the greatest because I'm closest to him. You know, each one says, I'm the greatest. What a shame. But you know, it's easy to judge. It's harder to realize that those three characters represent us. That we are the James, John, and Peters fighting over those things. Because we're not fighting to be the greatest servant. When we're not fighting to be the greatest servant, we are fighting to be the greatest in the world. Again, alluding to my dear friend, Tony Evans. He said, men, God is not opposed to greatness. God is opposed to pride. Big difference. Unfortunately, it's a difference not widely understood or embraced. God is not against greatness. The problem is our idea of greatness, right? God wants to make us into great servants, but first we have to realize how weak and helpless we are without Him. And finally, I want to talk about the high cost of discipleship. We're talking about the highs and lows. Why not the high cost of discipleship? There's a high cost to a high calling. If you look at the Bible, the higher the calling, the higher the cost. There's a, there, there's, there's a term that's used for special men with special mission in the Old Testament. They call them Nazarites. 
You know what a Nazarite is? A Nazarite would be equivalent to your modern day monk or nun. You know, you will have to give up a lot of things in your life to fulfill your calling. Samson was a Nazarite. A Nazarite man, you couldn't live an ordinary life. You couldn't drink. You couldn't, you couldn't do all the stuff that ordinary people do. Your life was set apart. It's a high cost because your calling is high. And you have to live that way so that you fulfill the righteous standards of God. So what is God saying about a high cost of discipleship? Simply put, you need to prioritize your priorities. Not just prioritize your lives, but prioritize your priorities. All of us have priorities. Let's, say, let's put it this way. But not all of your priorities are God's priorities. Not all of your priorities would fit the cost of discipleship. And Jesus made it clear, you want to follow me? I give you two priorities. Deny yourself, take up your cross. Two, very simple, very simply put, but not easy to follow. Denying self is deprioritizing your own life dreams and goals. He's saying, you want to prioritize your priorities? The first thing that you need to do is deprioritize the things you deem important in your life. Wow, that's not easy. In other words, you have to strike off your list of things, your bucket list. And of course, the other thing that you need to prioritize is take up your cross. So it's deprioritizing the things you deem important in your own life and putting God's priorities there. And of course, it is not only deprioritizing, it's reprioritizing now your life according to God's standards. And, and part of the reprioritizing your life is this. Your life used to be me first. I'm the most important person in the world. If this was the last boat of Titanic that was sinking, I get to get on board first. Because I'm important. I, me, and myself. And God is saying, you want to be a true disciple? You come last. You need to reprioritize, meaning put yourself last. Because the first will be last, and the last will be first with God. And it will cost you everything, the highs and the lows. How much is it going to cost you? Everything. Luke 9 says, foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests, the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. You know what he's saying? He's saying, I came from heaven where I had everything. Jesus. I came from heaven where I had everyone bowing to me. I came from heaven where I made everything. And now here I'm, I, I am on earth, I have nothing. Because I gave it all up for you cost of discipleship. Cost Jesus everything. And he not only gave up heaven for us, he walked the road to Calvary and he gave up his life. Cost him everything. Talk is cheap. But the day you say, I'm going to follow you, the payment starts. The payment starts. Talk is cheap. You can say, yes, I'm going to join this program. Yes, I'm going to buy into this. And then the person says, how are you going to pay? Credit card? And that's where the reality, right? The rubber meets the road. How much is it? Oh, to complete this program, you want to go through this surgery for chemo? 250,000 US. Wow, that much? Really? You want to get your PhD? 200,000? You want to do this? You want to buy this house? Maybe 2.2. If the other guy doesn't bid 2.6, that's the cost. Cha-ching. That's the cost. Talk is cheap. Payment comes. When you want to sign a contract. Salvation is free. But let me say this. Following Christ will cost you everything. Are you ready? I will never lie to you, especially when it comes to this. 
when I started serving God, I didn't realize how much it would cost me. Recently, when the doctor said, stage four cancer, I realized it may cost me my life. And that's where again, Jesus was saying, James, are you still following? Are you still there? Do you hear me? Are you still there? And I'm like, yes, right behind you, God. Right behind you. But I want to let you to know, know the truth too. That yes, there's a high cost to discipleship. But there's a higher cost to low living. I can talk about all the high costs of low living. Do you know that re the most recent stats on the cost of crime? The last one was done in 2013 and released in 2014 by the Office of the Auditor General of Canada. Do you know the average cost of housing inmates, criminals, is $118,000 a year to house one criminal? And it increased 46% between 2002 and 2012. Let me say that it's increased probably many times more. Do you know how much a homicide costs? One person that's murdered, between 4.8 and 5 million, 5.9 million. That's how much it costs when a murder is committed. Do you know how much a rape costs? It costs between 136,000 and 164,000. Robberies cost between 28,000 and 92,000. But that's just the financial cost, not including the human cost to the victim, to the perpetrator, to the families. We're not even including that cost. Let me say this, there's a high cost to low living. You know that. And we should be fully aware of that. The, the unacceptable high cost of living in fear and anxiety are everywhere in this life. Without Christ, there is an unacceptably high cost of living. Life without Christ is filled with fear, anxiety, inevitable death. No wonder Jesus, even when he's dealing with Christians, he says, do not worry, do not be anxious about tomorrow, because that's what that's what bombards everyone. Based again on data from 2010, which is a long time ago, the global direct and indirect direct economic cost of mental disorder, fears, worries, is estimated annually at $2.5 trillion. Anxiety, worries. Do you know that all those pills anti-anxiety, anti-depression pills. They sell in the billions of dollars. It's a big business. It's traded. It's one of the, 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 the most valuable traded commodities on the stock market. How about going to estimate the cost of broken marriages? Life without Christ, low living without Christ will cost you. Then look at Samson. I talk about Samson, the Nazarite. Special calling, high calling on his life. But you know what? With a high calling and high cost, he said, I don't want to pay the cost. So he chose low living for a season. Guess what it cost him? Judges 16 tells us. You know what it cost him? He lost his strength and his power. He lost the Holy Spirit, which is the worst thing. He lost his freedom. He became a prisoner. His loss, he lost his eyes. They dug it out. He lost his vitality. And finally, he lost his calling. And he lost his life. I think that's a higher cost that he paid than what he paid when he was a Nazarite. You see, the world says we want to live like the rest of high society. Instagram, TikTok, you name it, social media. Everybody wants to look like the richest celebrities, live like them, eat like them. That's what you see everywhere. We flaunt it, we, we show it in photographs. And yet, high life often comes with low living. The tragic set end of Jeffrey Epstein. 
a man who was so rich. He lived a jet setter's life. He mingled with the world's elite, which included President Bill Clinton, Bill Gates, Donald Trump, and of late, the scandal of Prince Andrew. These were the buddies he hung out with in the jets. But you know what? After all was exposed and the truth came out, he had a high life, but he was the lowest of low. He was a predator. He was charged, sent to prison, and of course, he hung himself because he didn't want to face justice. When he died, they said that he left behind $600 million in property, cash, investments, other amounts are lost, they don't know where it is. His brother, Mark, inherited everything. I only have one line to say, and I'll close. Luke 9, 25. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and himself is destroyed or lost and he loses his entire soul? Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord that you call us to a high calling with a high cost. And so, Lord, we pray for grace to live that life, grace to glorify you, grace to, comp to complete the race and glorify Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.